Um, so the Lord spoke to me on Monday, and it was about being thirsty. So I'm really excited to share it with you, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we had a bunch of water in a room. <laughs> um, but last night, we had a worship night, and Pastor Bob gets up there, uh, kind of transitioning, you know, kind of out towards the end of the evening, and he begins, like, basically preaching what the Lord spoke to me on Monday, uh, specifically about being thirsty. And I thought, oh, Lord, you're alive, <laughs> and I can hear your voice. Thank you. Um, and then he came back down. I said, please, when you go back up there, don't preach my message. I got, I got to share tomorrow. Um, but I'm very, very excited. And so I looked up in the middle of my prayer time on Monday when I felt like the Lord spoke to me. And by the way, that was the day of atonement on Monday, right? right? Yeah, pretty amazing. So I looked up on Google, because that's what everybody does. I looked up, what does it mean to be thirsty? Do you all want to hear it? Yeah. All right. So this is what WebMD says. You all know WebMD? It's that thing you look up every time you have a symptom. <laughs> you know, your nose is running, your foot feels weird, and you're like, what happened to me? And it says you have cancer. You know? <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's where Google, <laughs> that's where Google led me. And uh, it says this, thirst is your body's way of telling you that it's running low on water which it needs to work well. So how many know thirst is a symptom? Thirst is a symptom. It's just evidence of a water deficiency. Like I don't get thirsty before I have a water deficiency. I get thirsty after I've been running low. Are you with me? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 4. That's enough of WebMD. We'll come back to it. John chapter 4. Does anybody want a fresh drink this morning? As I go for my water bottle. All right, John chapter 4. Are you there? Who brought your Bibles? Hold them up. Let's see what we're working with. All right, cool. Hit somebody with it, would you? Bam! It's a sword. Be careful. All right. John chapter 4. It says this. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea. Where did he leave? Judea. Judea. And he departed again to where? To Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. Say he needed to go. Tell somebody, Jesus needed to go. He needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called, I think it's Sychar. Are there any theologians in the house? I'm going to go with Sychar because that's, what I've, that's how it registers. Okay, Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, here's something I wanted to know when I was reading this. That verse, that was a verse three, but he needed to go through Samaria. For some reason, that stood out to me. You ever have that when you're reading the word and all of a sudden something jumps out at you? That's because the Bible's alive, right? I said the Bible's alive. How many know the word is a person? So when we're reading the scripture, we're actually reading the genetic makeup of Christ himself. Isn't that powerful? So it said that he needed to go through Samaria. And I was wondering, why is that? And why is this standing out to me? Is it because he was on the Pharisees hit list, you know? I, don't, I wasn't sure. But then I looked into it. If I have a picture, I think we can display it for you. You all see that okay? Okay, so Judea is down south and Galilee is up north. And Samaria is right in between. Now... Typically, what do y'all know about Samaria? Let's do a little, little Bible Jeopardy. A little louder. Okay. What's that? Yeah, considered half-breeds by the Jews, for sure. So it wasn't the prime place for vacation of the time. Okay, let's just put it that way. So the Pharisees of the time, the religious folks, what they would do, if they were going to leave from Judea and go to Galilee, 
or the other way around, they would actually go through the trouble of crossing the Jordan, walking all the way down outside of Samaria, completely avoiding it, and then walking into Judea. That's what they would do. Just to avoid the untouchables. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm all about the shortest route. I pull up my GPS, Abby and I are driving, I'm like, which is faster? <laughs> right? So the Pharisees, they, didn't, they weren't about that life. They're like, no, I think I'm going to go out this way, totally avoiding these. But the Bible shows us, the book of John specifically, he says, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now, why is that? He didn't need to. In fact, people of his stature shouldn't have. Right? But yet he needed to. Isn't it interesting? Why, why, why did he need to go through Samaria, go to that exact region? Go to that exact city. Go to that exact plot of land. Go to that exact well at that exact time. Why did he have to do that? I would like to propose something to you, may I? It's this. Listen, I was reading this and I asked that question. And I feel like the Lord said, wherever I go is on purpose. Everywhere, listen, wherever the presence of Jesus is, there's a purpose for it. There's nowhere that Jesus Christ shows up that's an accident. Not a single place. This morning, did you feel the presence of the Lord? Okay, the presence of the Lord is not a UPS box that was shipped from heaven to just give us the warm and fuzzies. Right? It's not like, like we're like, oh, Lord, send us your presence. And then the Lord's like, Gabriel, check the shelves. And he goes over and he finds the presence box. You know, it's not like that. It's not like that. The presence of Jesus can only be if the person of Jesus is in the room. I can put it like this. So the presence is literally a product of proximity to a person. Are you following me? I, this might not sound super deep or profound, but to me, it's everything. Because I can get a little bit caught up in what happens when he's in the room. You know what I mean? You know, I get the goosebumps. Everybody ever get goosebumps in worship or, you know, where your hair kind of stands up and you're like, whoa, what was that? I can get kind of caught up in that and think, wow, that was amazing. I want to feel that more, right? But I can, I can get more caught up in the peace that I'm feeling when he's in the room. I can get more caught up on that than I am on the person that just brought the peace that's in the room. Are you with me? Wherever Jesus shows up, it is intentional. Whenever he arrives on the scene, it's on purpose. And to me, that is so, so encouraging. Can we keep reading? Okay. Starting in verse 7, right? Is that where we ended? All right. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Notice he didn't ask her, right? Was there a question there? Was that, hey, could I get some? No, he said, give me a drink. Verse 8, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Can you hear the sarcasm in her voice? <laughs> Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. See, the woman went to the well expecting to just draw some water. What she didn't realize is that she was actually going to a living well. She didn't realize that she was talking to the well. She thought she was just going to draw some water. And see, she was talking about natural water, right? That's what she thought was going on. 
But how many know Jesus wasn't talking about natural water? What was he talking about? He's talking about some kingdom water. He's not talking about natural thirst, although she was. He was talking about kingdom thirst. So everything that's happening here is symbolic, right, on Jesus' end. Now, she thinks he's talking about actual water. He's like, what is this guy talking about, living water? I mean, I mean really, put yourself in her shoes, right? She's thinking, I, what is this guy talking about? This, is, this makes no sense. He's such a weirdo, and he's a Jew. This is weird. But he, he wasn't talking about natural water. And I noticed something, and I kind of alluded to it, I guess, but in verse 7, it says, A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, what? What did he say? Give me a drink. Why do you think he asked her that? Why, why would, do you think he was thirsty? <laughs> do you think he was parched? He's sweating. I don't think so. I mean, he may have been thirsty, but I don't think that's why he asked. Because in the verse right after that, it says that his disciples went into town to buy some food, right? And if we keep reading, you'll see that later on his disciples come back and they see him and they say, hey, Rabbi, you need to eat some food. And then what did he say? Y'all remember? He said, I got food you know nothing about. Right? So I don't think, he wasn't interested in the food. I don't think he was interested in the water. What I think, so, so I'm reading this, and I'm like, why did you ask her, what, you didn't even ask, why did you tell her to give you a drink? And this is what I think. I think Jesus can only give us what he has when we give to him what we have. I think we can only give to Jesus, Jesus can only give us what he has when we give to him what we have. In other words, if we want to draw from the living well, we need to stop drawing from empty wells. See, she was going to this well, and again, this is metaphoric, right? Say this is symbolic. Go ahead and say it. Tell somebody in case they weren't paying attention. This is symbolic. So Jesus goes to the well, or excuse me, the woman's going to this well, and she's getting water and everything, but in her life, she's continuing to experience this thirst. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you. Notice he, he separates. There's two things happening here. So he's not just talking about himself. He's like, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. See, I think Jesus was a genius. I don't think his, his parallels or his parables were just on a whim. I think he knew what he was saying. I think Jesus often, actually oftentimes, Water is used as an example, also, obviously, of the Holy Spirit. But I think water is also an example of a relationship with God. I'm going to share something with you. If you're taking notes, write this down. Thirst, in this passage, I believe, thirst represents a need for love. Thirst represents a need for love. Water represents relationship with him. And I believe drinking represents intimacy. So let me put it this way. Okay, so Jesus, like, if you, if you knew the gift of God that was speaking to you, you would ask him for a drink, right? So when we drink of the water of Jesus, we become eternally quenched, right? When we have an intimate relationship with Jesus, our thirst for love becomes eternally quenched. I don't know if what I'm saying is making sense. Is this making sense? Sometimes it sounds better in my mind than it does in the microphone. I, I read WebMD to you earlier, right? Remember that? It says, this thirst is your body's way of telling you that it's running low on water, which it needs to work well. If we were to translate that along with this passage, we could read it like this. Your thirst for being loved is your body's way of telling you that it's running low on relationship with the Lord, which it needs to work well. Thirst for being loved is a symptom. Thirst for being loved is just the evidence of a deficiency in relationship. It's what you experience when you're low on relationship with the Lord. Not before, but after. So I say all this to say that I think this woman is like many of us. Are y'all with me this morning? Is this too much? Am I going too fast? We're okay? All right. 
I think we can relate to this woman. I know I can in my life. I don't know about you, but I can for sure. She's going to the well. Now, see, I think the well is actually, it has less to do with Jacob's well and more to do with the condition of her life. Because if you keep reading, in fact, let's keep reading. Y'all got to hear this. It says, verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And I watch this. Jesus said to her, you have well said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. See, she was looking for love in all the wrong places. She was drinking from an empty well. She was looking for relationship in the wrong places. She's looking for love in the wrong places. She tried five times, and she was with the sixth. Now, she didn't know no better, right? She didn't know any better, but she, she kept living through her life, trying relationship after relationship. And I just wonder if there's anybody here who's been drinking from an empty well. I just wonder. Maybe for you it's relationship. Maybe you can relate to her. You've been looking to satisfy something in your soul time and time again, and it's out of a really a pure desire for love, out of fulfillment, to be satisfied, a longing of your soul, and you've been looking to relationships to satisfy that thing, but for some reason, it just never quite does it. You know what I mean? I did that. Has anybody ever done that? Woo, I've been there. Man, I had the subscription. But maybe for you, it's not relationships. Maybe something else. Maybe for you, it's career goals. Maybe it's your business. Maybe you got a business and you're trying to grow that thing. And you think, man, if I can just get this to be, a, to be a bigger company one day, if I can just get this many employees, if I can just get it to be this prosperous, then I'll finally have that satisfaction. It's an empty well. Maybe it's working out. Man, maybe if I get my body to look like this, then maybe I'll finally, I'll finally feel that thing that I'm looking for. Maybe then people will like me. Empty well. Maybe if I can get my savings account up to this amount. Come on, am I talking to anybody this morning or is it just me? Y'all quiet on me. Maybe if I can just get my savings account a little bit higher. Maybe if I can get my 401k up a little bit more, right? Maybe if I can make a few more friends in my neighborhood. Maybe if I can get that promotion. I must be talking to myself, Sebastian. What do you think? It's quiet, man. Nobody can relate to me. Nobody. Maybe it's, maybe it's dating. Maybe it's, I don't know what it could be. Maybe it's Netflix. Netflix, y'all, it's an empty well. Come on, man. We all know it. My wife and I know it. We get, we get home. It's been, it's been a long week. And you're like, you know what sounds really good? You know, my love. What is it? Pizza, cookies, Netflix. <laughs> Kids Corner Pizza, chocolate chip cookies, Netflix, or Amazon Prime. Can anybody relate with me now? Are we on the same page? Hallelujah. But isn't it interesting, y'all? Like, we do this, okay? We literally, we just did it on Friday, and I'm feeling really bad about myself. But we just, we go home, and we do these things. We watch these things and all that. But isn't it interesting? Now, maybe I'm alone on this. This is a real poll I'd like to take, okay? This isn't some CNN, Fox News poll. This is a Jake Lazar poll, okay? Real poll. We did this on Friday. Now, Saturday came, <laughs> Saturday came rolling around. And you know what I wanted to do? Well, no. <laughs> I should have. No, I wanted to watch another movie. I wanted to eat more Kids Corner pizza. And I wanted to eat more chocolate chip cookies. Have you ever done that? Come on, man. You like, you binge one night and then the next night comes or maybe like Monday comes. And you're like, oh, I just can't wait for Friday. Oh, I can stay up late. We can watch like three movies. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying? Isn't it something that it never fully quenches us? Friday night, I go to bed. It must have been close to midnight. You're already in bed because you're smarter than me and better than me in every single way. But I went, I, went to, <laughs> I went to bed, man, and I'm like, this wasn't even really worth it. Because I woke up, and I'm like, man, I'm tired, you know, kind of groggy and everything. And I got like the shame thing in my head, like, you better hit that treadmill, son. Y'all know what I'm saying? It's an empty well. Netflix is an empty well. Now, listen, 
is Netflix bad? Is <laughs> all the <laughs> all the parents are like, yup. <laughs> is watching movies bad? It depends on the movie, right? Okay. But is watching good movies, rated G? Is watching Ice Age bad? Ice Age, that's so old. What am I, what's a new one? Frozen 2, that's true, that's a thing. Okay. Is watching Frozen 2 bad? We are a sanctified church. I'm just going to continue, okay? <laughs> Watching movies in and of itself is not a bad thing. Eating chocolate chip cookies is not a bad thing. We're going to keep doing it. I promise. Tonight, hopefully. <laughs> All of the things that I mentioned, wanting to have a prosperous business, is that a bad thing? Of course not. Wanting to be the best teacher in your school, is that a bad thing? Is wanting to be the best student a bad thing? No. Is wanting to be married a bad thing? No. Is wanting to, to date a bad thing? No. In and of these things, in and of themselves, they are not bad things. They're not inherently bad. But if they are a well in your life, then yes, they are bad. So each of us have to identify in our lives, okay, why is it that I want to watch a movie, eat cookies, and uh, pizza? You know, why is it? No, really. If I, I have to self-evaluate. If I'm doing it because we just want to have a fun date night and just enjoy a movie or something, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But if I'm going to it because I'm so drained and I just need a little bit of rest, I need some me time, all of a sudden now I realize that thirst represents something much deeper. When I go into that, then I realize, wait a second, I have a deficiency that this Netflix can't quench. Are you feeling me? I'm going to start preaching in a minute. <laughs> what, what wells are you drinking from? Ask yourself that. Think about it. What wells am I drinking from? What is it that I turn to? What app do I open on my phone to get rest? What is it that when I go on vacation, why, why is it? That when I go on vacation and I come home, I need a vacation for my vacation. Why is that? Why is it that when I go on a seven-day vacation, I come home and I need another three days? Why is that? Can anybody relate? Listen, man, vacation can't give you rest. Vacation, listen, man, vacation without Jesus Christ every single day in that vacation, we can't take no breaks from him. Vacation without him will leave us even worse than when we left. Because we went searching for something, we didn't find it, and we come home different in the wrong way. We can't take a vacation from Jesus. <laughs> there are no vacations from Jesus. When my wife and I, I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just letting you know. We've taken some different trips, and we go on them. And sometimes, like, I have a personal standard in my own life of spending time with the Lord every day, just a personal conviction that I have, and so I live by that. And then we go on vacation, and there's been times when I haven't done that because I'm on vacation, you know? Like, hey, we're going to sleep in because we just ate a lot of bad food last night. We're going to go to the beach or wherever we are. We're going to go do something fun. And so I, I allow that time with the Lord to not happen because we're on vacation. And like I said, I come home, and I'm like, man, that wasn't even worth it. We spent hundreds of dollars, and for what? So we go to Montana, and we're both like, we're actually excited. We wake up in the morning, and we both separate. And like in Matthew 6, when Jesus said, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And then the Father who is in secret sees you in secret will reward you openly. Isn't it amazing when we go into our secret place and we shut the door, he is willing. He could have just said that. He could have just said, when you pray, go into the room, shut the door. And that would have been good enough, right? Anybody in here would have objected to him for that? <laughs> no, of course not. But he had the wherewithal to add to that. 
He said, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father in secret. And when he sees you praying in secret, he will reward you openly. What could the reward be? What's the reward? Is it what I have needs of? I would disagree. We're family. We can do that, right? <laughs> We're just at the table talking right now, right? We're good. I thought peace. Like I literally thought whatever it was that I was lacking in my life, whatever, he, whatever it is that I needed, that would be my reward. That's what I thought. I really did. But I would like to propose that the reward is not something that he can give to us. The reward that he was talking about was himself. So he says, when you go into your prayer room and you shut the door and you pray to your father who's in secret and he will reward you, he's talking about, I'm going to come in there. When you go into your room, you shut the door and you pray, I'm coming. You just made an appointment. And how many know when Jesus walks into the room, it's on purpose? He doesn't show up on accident. Whenever Jesus comes on the scene, there is purpose in his wings. When he walks into your room in your prayer in your prayer time, he's there not because you just sent him an invitation. He's there because he knows you have something, you have a need that he has the answer for. And maybe, and maybe this is oftentimes for me, what happens when Jesus shows up? You know what, what he shows me that I need? He's like, I just wanted to be with you. Yeah. Now, what, what's the purpose behind that? I'm not trying to go too deep on you here. Am I going too deep? Okay. If he's just there, and if he knows that all I just need to spend time with him, I just need to be there, and he just wants to be there, what could that mean? What's the purpose of that? It's because I've been spinning my wheels, and I've been going, 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 and I need a little bit of rest. That's the purpose. Are you with me? So if he shows up in your prayer room, and he's like, hey, I just want to enjoy. Hey, I just want you to enjoy. That's it. Just, just sit back and relax. Just you and me. Maybe that means you just need some rest for your soul. If he shows up in the room and he wants to impart a gift of, of, of healing into my life, well, then that's the purpose, right? So I can go be a blessing to others in my community, in the church, right? Where, whatever purpose he has when he shows up, it's, it's intentional. Whenever he shows up, it's on purpose. Are you with me this morning? I don't even know where I'm at anymore. My goodness. Can I get some piano, please? Literally anybody that can play. Is anybody thirsty this morning? Listen, I promise you, Jesus is in the room, and he's going to give you a fresh drink this morning. For anybody that wants it, I promise you. WebMD, it also says this. Listen to this. This is not the Bible, but check it out. It's normal to feel thirsty when it's hot or after you've powered through an intense workout. But if you're constantly refilling your cup without relief, it could signal another health condition. It's normal to feel thirsty when it's hot or after you've powered through an intense workout. How many know life is an intense workout? Listen, man, y'all deal with stuff that some people may never understand. You go to work and you're constantly surrounded with negativity, that's work. You know what I mean? You come home and maybe your family's going through a hard time, that's work. Life can be intense. Life can be hard. Jesus guaranteed that says, but if you're constantly refilling your cup without relief, it could signal another health condition. John chapter 7, verse 37. It says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If anybody thirsts, what does thirst represent? The need to be loved. If anybody has a need to be loved, how many know we all do? Regardless, if you've been living for the Lord your whole life, or whether you're here right now and you have not been living for the Lord at all, we all equally have a need, a longing, a craving for love. 
And he said, if anybody, what did he say there? If anyone thirsts, if anybody is needing this love, come to me and drink. The act of drinking, it represents intimacy with him. And the water is the relationship. Are you with me? This is so profound. It is to me. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. How many know before we can drink, we got to come to him? It would make no sense for me to try to get, let's say this water bottle is empty, okay? It's empty. This represents your life, perhaps. Or maybe you just got a little bit, maybe you got half, whatever. It would make no sense for me to try to drink from an empty water bottle, right? I can only get water if I go to the sink. I know this sounds like kids' church, but how many know we could use a little bit more kids' church? As adults, we get way too complicated. <laughs> we try to think of way too hard. I can't get water unless I go to the sink. I can't get water unless I go to the well. We can't get a drink from Jesus unless we go to Jesus. You can pick up your devotional all day long. <laughs> you can pick up your devotional, your Our Daily Bread. You can read it, you know. I love that thing, by the way. Whatever your, how many of you read a devotional? Anybody in here every day you got a devotional? Great. You can read that every day, and it can still be an empty well. Pick up your devotional all you might. Pick up your TV remote. Pick up your iPhone. Pick up whatever it is that you want that's within arm's reach, and it will be an empty well without Jesus. Can I, can I just challenge you one more time with something different? Can I? May I? You gave me permission, Mike. Yeah, you nodded at me. With that beard of yours, it means go. Yeah. You can read, reading your Bible without a relationship with Jesus is an empty well. I think I will. Reading your Bible without a relationship with Jesus is an empty well. Why do you think some atheists know their Bible better than some Christians and still are dead? The word without the sun, it's like an outlet without electricity. Am I right, Austin? Austin's an electrician. <laughs> Imagine trying to use an outlet with no electricity. That's trying to use the word without a relationship. It's like saying, you know, well, in Jesus' name, I command this to happen. And the thing's like, I don't even, you don't even know the one you're talking about. Remember in the book of Acts? I can't remember the, the sons of Sceva, right? When they were like, they, they were encountered this man who was possessed by a demon. And they said, come out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> okay, right motive, first of all, okay. They get a star for that. But the demon spoke out of the man. Okay, this is in your Bible, okay. I'm not a weirdo. <laughs> Has this ever happened to you at work? Lord, we pray that it does happen to us at work. Anyway, so the demon speaks out of the man, and he says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Oh, then what happened? I'm glad you asked. It wasn't pretty. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, the demon within the man jumped on the sons of Sceva, whooped their, yeah, and they left naked and bruised and bleeding. It was not a good day for the sons of Sceva. They definitely went home and watched Netflix and ate some cookies because they were not having a good rest of their day. Without the Holy Spirit inside of you, and without an active relationship with Jesus, the Bible will just be a book. 
John chapter 5, in case you think I'm blaspheming, it says in verse 39 and verse 40, this is Jesus talking, okay? This is what he said. Watch this. He said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Life is not in the papers. It's not in the gold binding. It's not in the leather. It's not in any of that. Life is in Jesus Christ himself. In him alone. There's nothing else that works. Listen, America is so thirsty. I would argue America is dehydrated. This morning, if you want a fresh drink, some of y'all, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. I've been preaching right at you, and you know it. You know it. You've been drinking from empty wells. Can everybody stand with me? You are not here on accident. You're like, ah, yeah, I suppose we could go to church today. You might have thought it was just a good idea, but it wasn't just a good idea. I would like to inform you, this is a heavenly spoiler alert. Warning, warning, warning. It wasn't a good idea for you to come, it was a God idea. Listen, some of y'all, you're parched. Some of y'all, you're dehydrated. And Jesus wants to give you a fresh drink this morning. And if I were you, I would accept that drink. If I were you, I would accept that drink. I'm going to read something to you real quick. This is Isaiah. I think it's 58. I hope I uh, got the right verse here. It's talking about the chapter about fasting and It says in verse 11, this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, the Lord will guide you continually, and watch this, and satisfy your soul in drought, and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Listen, this morning, if you want it, you can have it. If you want a fresh drink, if you need a fresh drink, it, and even as Pastor Shar was saying earlier, if maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, dude, right now is your moment. Right now is your time. The Bible says that now is the time of salvation. Some translations say today, but it's more proper rendering would be now. Because to be honest with you, we don't know what's going to happen when we walk out of the building. You might not make it home. You don't know. You're like, that's not, you can't say that. I'm just, I'm just saying. Okay. We don't know. We don't know. But what we do know is that when we, as long as you have breath in your lungs, you have the chance to give your life to Christ. You have the chance right now. Don't let it pass you by. Don't let it pass you by. And not just that, but there are, I believe with all my heart, there are many of us in this room who have been drinking from empty wells, and you, I, you can identify when I say that. So I'm going to ask you to do something. We're not going to be long. But Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, come to me and drink. He said, come to me and drink. He didn't say, stay there and I'll come to you. So I'm going to ask you to come forward. Not because, in just a moment, just a moment. Not because there's something special about coming up front. In fact, we're losing square footage. Thank you, baptism. It's not about that. It's not about the, this part of the room. It's just a symbol to the Lord that I'm willing to come to you. That's all it is. Every single person that Jesus called, it was in public. Don't leave here like the rich young ruler who left sad. Don't leave here sad. So on the count of three, I'm doing that to help break the ice. Because if, because you know, right now some of y'all, your hearts are beating. And you know you want to come forward, but you're kind of nervous. Okay, we all know, right? We're all in the same boat. But I'm going to count to three. We're all going to do it at the same time, okay? And you're going to come up, and you're just going to give your life. You're going to give that empty well, whatever it is in your life. You're going to give that to Jesus, and he's going to give you a fresh drink. And we might even come around and pray for you. 
We'll just kind of feel it out and see what happens. Does that sound good to you? What time do the Packers play? Who cares? Oh, oh, yeah, we're good. We're good. All right, close your eyes all around this place. Holy Spirit, you're working on hearts right now. I can feel it. I know it. I know it. I know it. You're knocking on hearts. You're just, you're tapping shoulders. Jesus, your presence is more real in this room than the shirts hanging from the people's shoulders. And I am so thankful, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. Lord, I thank you that as each person comes forward this morning, they're leaving behind their empty wells. They're leaving them behind as they take a step forward. And I even pray that if anybody's here who's never given their life to you, I pray that you would have their heart beating so hard right now that they need a blood pressure check. (laughs) Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All right, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Come on. Don't get in the baptism tank. I know you're thirsty. Just begin to pray as you come forward. And if you would, come up as close as you can to the front. And just just begin to surrender. What is the empty well? Verbalize it. Express it from your heart to him. Just share with him. What is it that you've been drinking from? Give that to him. Some of you, it's a longing for a relationship. I can feel that real strong in the room. It's like you just want the relationship. I want a relationship. I want a relationship. And that's a good thing. But I think for some of us, it's been, a, it's been a well that we're trying to get life from. Surrender that to him right now. I feel even alcoholism in the room. You've been turning to, been turning to some alcohol. Maybe nothing severe. Maybe it is severe. But give that to him. He's, he's going to set you free of that thing tonight. Some of you, even nicotine. I don't know what's the deal with this, but yeah, if you like chew or whatever, maybe, I don't know if it's chew or cigarettes or whatever, but you can be free of that this morning. Just go ahead. Give, give, up, give up those wells. Give up those wells. He's asking you for a drink, just like he did the Samaritan woman right now. He said, give me a drink. That's what he's telling you right now. Give me a drink. Give him what you have, and then he's going to give you what he has. Give him what you have. How do I do that? Just tell him, I give this to you. If you didn't come forward and you want to, you still can. You still can. Come to Jesus and drink, man. What are you waiting for? What could you possibly drink that's better than him? I know for a fact there's some <laughs> somebody here, man. I'm not trying to single you out or nothing. I'm just trying to trying to hook you up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. If you're with somebody and 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 you want to come up with somebody, you can do that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just, I just shatter fear in this place. Lord, I pray for peace. Peace from your very presence. You being in the room, Jesus. Pray that your peace would saturate hearts all around this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Is there anybody here that's, uh, you've been working on, like you work on cars and you like bummed out your shoulder or something? Like you're working on a car and you like hurt something? Maybe it's not your shoulder, I don't know. Anybody that's been working on cars and you got, you just like sore or hurting? I can't see if anybody's raising their hand. Okay, maybe not. Well, right now, Lord, if somebody's watching online, 
But I just speak healing over their body. What if it's their shoulder or if it's something else in their body? Lord, we just thank you for healing in Jesus' name. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, now just all around this place, begin to just worship him. Just worship him. Out loud, nice and loud. All around this place, whether from the front to the back, from the left to the right, just begin to worship. Just begin to worship. Yeah, 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 yeah. We worship you, Jesus. Just keep worshiping. He's breaking off anxiety in the room. He's breaking off anxiety in the room, that depression thing, that thing you've been going going to. Some of us, anxiety has been a trophy in your life, and he wants to, he's just breaking that off of you. It's like you've had more faith in your anxiety than in Jesus. I say, be free this morning. Be free this morning in Jesus' name. Let that thing go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just eliminating that thing. Wow, if you've, if you've been dealing with anxiety or depression, mental health, just put your hand right on your heart. Lord, I thank you for crushing that completely. You can do in a moment what that medicine and counseling can't do in a lifetime. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like he's given you a prescription and it's your secret place. Yeah, it's Matthew 6.6. 6. That's, your, that's your subscription. That is your or prescription, excuse me. <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I just, we just thank you again this morning. We thank you for a fresh drink. Lord, we thank you for, for satisfying souls that have been in drought. Oh, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. Satisfying parched souls. Thank you. You said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You are righteousness, Jesus. That's you. So thank you. Thank you for fresh drink, Lord. Thank you, pastors. Do you guys feel anything? Anything? Here? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, all around this place, take somebody's hand. We're just going to pray as we close. Now, right now, wherever you are, pray for the person next to you like you would like them to pray for you. <laughs> None of those pansy prayers. Come on now. <laughs> Pray in faith. Oh, thank you, Lord, for an impartation of craving your presence more than anything. In Jesus' name, every single heart, those watching online, those in the sound booth, Every single person, those in the kids' church, Lord, that each of us, every single one of us, myself included, that we would crave your presence more than anything. Lord, that you would hijack our cravings. That you would hijack our hunger and our thirst. Lord, that we would feed on your presence. That we would feed on you walking into our room. And out of that place, we would feed on your scriptures, the living word of God. 
Lord, I pray that each one of us would be so unlike the world, it would smell like it. Lord, I pray that we would be living wells everywhere we go to those who are in our jobs, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our families, our children, our parents, our coworkers, the bus driver, the Walmart clerk. Lord, I pray that each one, all of us, we would be, we would be fountains of living water and that we would pour out living water, your living love. The water represents a relationship with you, Lord. I pray that we would pour out, that we would ooze a relationship with the living Son of God. Lord, that every person around us would recognize that they have a thirst for what we are drinking. Lord, that each person would realize they need to drink from the well that we're going to. Lord, I pray that people would see our lives and that they would see, man, there's something different there. And that we would be walking billboards in Jesus' name. That we would be walking billboards with a giant arrow pointing straight up in the name of Jesus. Lord, may we really be the church. May we go out beyond the walls beyond the walls of our own comfort and may we step out in boldness and in courage and pour out your love in Jesus name everywhere that we go may we be leaky Christians oh God put a leak in our spirits that everywhere we go somebody else is going to get wet in the name of Jesus Lord we say yes to your plans we say yes to your purposes we say yes to revival and we say here am I send me here am I, send me, send me everywhere that I go. Go ahead, commit yourself to him right where you are. Say, here am I, send me. Where, everywhere that I go, it's your territory. We're going to take territory. Everywhere I step my foot, you step your foot. My mouth is yours. <laughs> my eyes are yours. My hands are yours. Hey, my wallet is yours. Everything that I have, all that I am, is yours. May I be contagious. May I infect everybody I come into contact with. With the Jesus virus. Hey! Lord, we bless you, and I bless your people in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for this commitment. And Lord, I just feel like you're charging us. I feel like there's a charge from heaven. You leave this place. Make sure you have a secret place. And don't let it get dusty. I'm telling you, if you came, especially those of you that came forward, this goes for everybody, but for those of you that came forward, you recognize that there was a need in your life. It is so important that you don't let this be a one-time drink. We have to have a drink every day. I drink, listen, man, we all drink throughout the day. We have to be drinking throughout the day. Are you with me? So I charge you in the name of Jesus to go home, to go into your workplace, wherever you go, and be drinking. How do you do that? Just be mindful of the Lord all day, every day. And, and for those of you, your parents, it's hard for you to have like a long extended time in prayer. There's grace for you. Find what works. Find what works, okay? So God bless you. Hug somebody before you go and go be contagious. In Jesus' name.